invitation for me to speak to everyone today and thanks for everyone for joining me for the seminar today. I'll be talking about community interpreting my experience in Australia and in New Zealand. And another topic is about before and after getting your NATI certification. I know a lot of you have been very interested in getting a certification, but I find not many people um, looking to what you need to do after you get your NATI certification because they do have certain requirements you need to meet every three years in, um, to keep the certification. So my slides are about these two topics, but maybe today we won't have time to go into the after certification part. That could be for another um, another day. So today we'll be focusing on my community experience and uh, also pathways uh, about how we can get NATI certification. So a little bit more about me, um, I started a uh, interpreting and uh, translation course in Melbourne and got my certification in 2015, back when NATI still endorsed some courses. Um, but right now, NATI does not endorse like, um, like uni university courses anymore. Um, we used to be able to just pass our exam at our uni and we'll be able to apply for our NATI certification with our schools. So back then, if we get 70% accuracy in our uh, NATI exam, which we did in our uni, we'll be able to get the level three, uh, which is then called professional interpreter, and now it's called certified interpreter accreditation. Um, but now everyone who hasn't got NATI certification would have to sit the NATI exam. So we'll be talking about different pathways for people to get the certified interpreter or the certified provisional interpreter um, certification. So I also worked in Melbourne from 2015 to 2019 and some agencies I work with are this uncle and all graduates. These are all local agencies based in uh, Victoria. But there are many, many different agencies in different states and territory. And there's even a nationwide um, telephone interpreting hotline. It's called uh, TIS National. So it's like the easy speak we have right now in New Zealand, but um, many of you probably know Easy Speak is actually originally an Australian company. So they're providing similar services here in New Zealand, like the TIS National is doing. Um, something else about me is I'm working in Christchurch right now with, for the Canterbury DHB. So it's mainly about medical interpreting and not, I'm not so much doing easy speak telephone interpreting. That is something I did before. And so let's talk about community interpreting. So I haven't really done as much community interpreting in New Zealand because I only moved here in mid 2019. So in Australia, because it's full of immigrants and they do need help with language and all kinds of aspects in their life. So they do, they provide all kinds of interpreting, including when people, uh, visa applicants need to do their physical exam examination, they will have visa medical center calling out to interpreters to help them answer certain questions and including police because random public member could just come up to a police station and ask for help and hospitals, including different kind of um, healthcare clinics, even like cosmetic surgery clinics, they could just call up and uh, use your help. So it can be anything. It can be anything that you encounter in uh, community interpreting in Australia. And uh, most of all, you'll probably do, be dealing like uh, utility companies like for water, power, gas, and internet, and also banks. So this type of uh, interpreting um, 
especially if you are in New Zealand and you want to familiarize yourself with the, this type of Australian concepts, you can try to you can try to work with Easy Speak here because when I work with them, about four out of five phone calls I picked up would be actually from Australia. So if you are interested in sitting the NAT exam, which would be highly focused on um, real life experience in Australia, uh, you may consider signing up with Easy Speak and starting picking up phone calls and just familiarize yourself with um, what people encounter in Australia. And uh, in Australia, we also do like court and tribunal interpreting. And in an Australian court, or maybe at least in Melbourne court, the booking is not like uh, one hour or two hours. It's uh, always like half day or full day, because in Australia, the court system is not as organized as in New Zealand. Um, everyone who has their court, they have to appear at court on this day, would have to arrive at court at about nine o'clock and they have to wait here for the, uh, for the court staff to decide whose cases are going to be called at what time. So everyone who have a case that day will have to come first thing in the morning and they all wait in the court. So that's why when we get a court interpreting assignment, it's always half day or full day. But it's not like that in New Zealand. It's a lot more organized. So that's just something um, I found very different and uh, very interesting. And we, in Australia, there's a lot of tribunal interpreting and a lot of them are about like home violence or about um, immigration matters. A lot of people, especially visa applicants, they will need a lot of help in the application process or even like appeal process and some of them will go to tribunals. And other than that, the most cases I did when I did legal interpreting in Australia is actually about uh, home violence related cases. And uh, in Victoria, um, in Melbourne's Magistrates Court, it's called um, intervention order. Now, most people would be seeking an intervention order um, issued by the judge. So it's to help the home violence victim to stay away from the perpetrators. And uh, diff in different states, it's called different things. I think in Queensland or Gold Coast, it's called a protection order. So if you are interested in knowing more, um, you could have a look into this topic and what it is called in different uh, states because in real life, it is something that comes up very regularly. And uh, at NATI test, uh, NATI test, they have a focus on legal and uh, medical topics. So um, if you have time, feel free to do more research on this area. And people in Australia also, they, they need uh, interpreters to help them with their doctor's appointment and even driving tests when they are doing like their first stage test, which is just a knowledge test, and their second stage, which is a practical driving test, they will need someone to go with them. So, and the maternity and children's uh, appointment, this is mostly about uh, a nurse will see the children and mom regularly for their immunization and for the children's growth. And in Australia, they, they have the national immunization schedule um, which um, will be like semi-mandatory for parents to immunize their children because if they don't do that, their children can be denied um, childcare or like, some certain benefits. So in Australia, immunization is something pretty much all parents do for their children. And they have a schedule of what? vaccinations and at what time that you should give your children. So if you are interested in naughty tests, this is something that you could have a look and prepare your glossary with. And another thing is parent and teacher meetings. That's something that I did semi-regularly, especially just before the school holidays, there will be a lot of parent and teacher meetings. So there's really a wide range of uh, assignments that 
happened in Australia, and these are based on my experience. Um, so if you want to know more about Australian interpreting, um, I've also created a relatively simple table to compare some certain um, terms that come up quite regularly in our daily life. Like we have IRD in New Zealand, which is called the uh, ATO Australian Tax Office in Australia, which is straightforward. And in Australia, different states and territory have their own uh, driving testing and issuing authorities. And in, Australia, in New Zealand, we have AA. And uh, the benefit um, authority in Australia is called Centrelink. They are this, uh, they are this responsible for stuff like Medicare and uh, issuing concession card and benefits for people. In New Zealand, the uh, equivalent is work and income. And uh, at the bottom is easy speak and test national. They are similar in the service they provide. In Australia, TIS national is a free telephone interpreting service available to pretty much everyone. And uh, if you don't speak English in Australia, but you need to speak to like banks or government or school, most of these agencies will accept TIS national phone calls because you have to call them yourself and uh, an inter uh, and then use the automated voice system to choose your your um, language you speak and the interpreter of that language will pick up your phone call and you need to tell this interpreter what number you actually need them to dial for you so that's how it works in australia with tis national and in new zealand i think it's quite straightforward it's usually the agencies who dial um we will call the easy speak interpreters. Um, so I will then move on to a bit more about NATI. This uh, table is about some recent changes to the NATI accreditation system. Um, it was called NATI accreditation before um, 2018, but they decided to transition into this new certification system. And um, so when I joined NATI, I was actually called a uh, professional interpreter, which was called level three before that. And now I have transitioned into certified interpreter. So I've listed only level two and level three in this table because that's the level two and level three interpreters are the ones who mainly work in community interpreting and level two, which is called certified provisional interpreters, are also, uh, it is also the lowest um, accreditation people need to get to, uh, to be able to work in community interpreting in Australia right now. And uh, so actually, NATI has, um, is already working on and uh, implementing new um, certification, which is called Certified Specialist Health Interpreter and uh, Certified Specialist Legal Interpreter. Um, these, they, Australia is actually considering in a few years time that to regulate that only these specialist interpreters can work in hospitals in like health setting or and only the specialist legal interpreters can work in the at court. So it is something on top for people to work on. For me to, for people like me, certified interpreters, if we want to become a specialist, we need to take on extra test actually to become even more qualified to be working in health or legal settings in Australia later on. And they are actually already, they are already, um, unis that offer courses specializing in either health or legal interpreting. So this, this trend of NATI um, changes, it does get, um, it does get a bit more strict every, every few years. Um, so, and then we'll talk about the different pathways 
to get to become certified interpreter or certified provisional interpreter here. Uh, this table is from NATI's uh, the certification uh, summary, design summary. It's a document you can download from your website, and I have uh, included the download link in my slide, last page. So feel free to ask for a copy of the slide, and you can download this uh, the whole document for yourself to keep. And here I've got the certified interpreter pathways. So we've got four pathways, and uh, for most people, uh, for most of the interpreters in New Zealand, the pathway two should probably be the most suitable. Um, that requires us to graduate from an endorsed uh, interpreting qualification. Uh, most of the not endorsed interpreting qualification, I think, would be located in Australia, but as long as uh, it's a uh, interpreting related uh, qualification and advanced diploma or higher, that's still qualified. And uh, another another requirement is that we have to meet the language proficiency, ethical competency, and the intercultural competency test. So for this pathway, if you take the um, certified interpreter test, that alone is uh, 880. And uh, depending on your, if you are a native English speaker or if you have uh, done certain training that require you to have certain English proficiency, you might not need to take extra tiers like TOEFL tiers or something else. else. Uh, in that case, you will still need to um, pass the uh, ethical and the intercultural training and tiers, which NATI offers online. And uh, each it, they are 220 each. So the minimum, the minimum um, you will have to prepare for this uh, will be 1320 to, to uh, do the to see the test and to pass the ethical and intercultural competency test. Uh, just going to quickly show you what the uh, requirement for English proficiency is. So for people, uh, native English speakers, they just want you to prove basically that you've grown up in an English speaking country and you went to, you were educated there. So you will need like primary and secondary education certification or your secondary and tertiary education certification to prove that you've grown up in an English speaking country. Otherwise you can Proof that um, you have completed a, a tertiary qualification and it has to be degree level or higher and it has to be taught in English. Um, or if you don't fit the other two requirements, you will have to sit an English proficiency test. And here's the fees that I just mentioned for certified interpreter is 880. And for certified professional interpreter test is 550, plus the in ethical and intercultural training that of, uh, NATI just offers is 220 each. So at least if you go for the certified professional interpreter, you will be 990 at least to do the NATI test. And there's other Pathway three and pathway four, I think for pathway three, that means you will already have, you will already be certified, maybe in another language. And then you can, you can, you can just uh, sit the naughty test for another language. And pathway four, it still requires you to be at least provisionally certified interpreter. So there's no way that we can just, we can, get around this. There's no way that we can not take the naughty test. Um, so this is for pathway four. If you are a professionally certified interpreter and you have at least three years um, working experience and plus you have to do professional development activities. So pathway two is probably the most straightforward for people, for interpreters in New Zealand who want to see the test. 
in the next slide, I'll show you the pathway for the five pathways for people who want to see the certified provisional interpreter test. So pathway one and two is pretty much the same, but the level of qualification is a bit lower. It only needs to be diploma or higher, not, uh, the, not advanced diploma. Um, and there's a new one, it's a pathway five. The pathway five says if you hold an RT recognized practicing interpreter credential in any language, you can sit this test, but um, you, can, you can't just get uh, recognized, um, not even recognized, um, because if they do offer, unless they don't offer your language testing regularly, and if you, they do offer test in your language regularly, you just have to sit the test, and you can't even ask them to um, recognize you. So um, for both certified provisional interpreter or certified uh, interpreter, the most straightforward pathway is still um, you still apply for the test and uh, finish complete the online training. So next one is the an overview of all the uh, prerequisites for the pathway. So no matter which pathway you choose, you still have to have training. You still have to finish the ethical and intercultural competency training. And, but you can submit your application before you complete those two trainings. And then you can sit the certification test. And then like, like I mentioned before, for um, when I did it back in 2015, um, you will be granted the professional interpreter if you got a 70% accurate or higher in your test. And I forgot about how much it was for paraprofessional, but I think it will probably be 60%. I'm not sure if that's still true, but that's something for you to consider when you're preparing your test. Um, so, okay, here, and here's a quick look of what's involved in the certification test. Uh, I think most people are quite familiar with these um, tests um, when, you, um, when you do your training. Um, but they did, there's something new that they added um, after I got the certification, which is the simultaneous interpreting, the two on the, at the bottom here. When I did receive my certification back in 2015, we didn't need to do simultaneous interpreting. So that is something more challenging and uh, that is something that requires time and effort to practice. Um, so back in the days, I, we did the uh, at uni, but we never really need to test for it. Um, so now NATI test will do two dialogues and two side translations, and these side translations will be uh, directly related to the dialogues. And uh, plus after that will be four monologues, including consecutive and the simultaneous interpreting. And all these will be, so eight tasks in total, and all eight tasks will take about one and a half hours to complete. And all interpreting tasks now, um, they are really based on real life exchanges. And I've heard from people who have involvement in assisting with the NATI test that the NATI test have become quite a lot more difficult than how it was. Uh, right now, it is really um, for people who want to pass the test, it is. Uh, it does require people to have real life interpreting experience already. So you do have to. You do need to have the glossary and the skills in your real life interpreting in order to be successful to pass the NATI test. So I believe everyone here are already practitioners and we do interpreting very regularly. Um, but it is still something. We just need to be more familiar, familiarized with the Australian um, Australian life, and uh, 
more they are focused on the legal um here health there's there will be one topic in the health domain and one in the legal domain so i think following this pandemic there's definitely going to be probably COVID in the test um but yeah saying that we don't know how long it will take for the borders to open again. So hopefully Nati will consider setting up the test centers in New Zealand, or at least um, make it easier, or even provide remote testing. We can only hope. Um, so that will be all for today's uh, presentation. I've got another six slides, but that's about what you have to do after you get your NATI certification because they do have some requirements that if you only want to do it part-time you can find it very hard to keep your certification after three years so that's something that we can also talk about next time um so thank you for your participation and i'll give time back to hayden and if you have any questions i will try my best to answer